like, okay. So I took a picture of the vacant lot and then I called my bank rep and I'm like, dude, that house is gone. And he's like, well, uh, I guess that's what we get for not paying attention to our assets. I'm like, sorry. He's like, no problem. I still got paid my 50 bucks because I went and did what I got hired to do. But I'm like, that property is gone. He's like, well, sorry. So those are how BPOs work. They were just brokers. And like I said, showed you, they were actually trying to circumnavigate paying another 400 bucks. So they pay 50 to 75. Then it got into this thing of, hey, if you do it for free and we take this property through foreclosure, we'll let you list it. So they, then they started baiting us with, well, we're not even going to pay. We'll give you the listing if we go to the foreclosure process. Problem with that is in today's uh, world, it was a year or two before that ever got to the listing stage. So that really kind of fizzled out really fast. <clears throat> now, over there on the next page, we're talking about the process by which an appraiser works. Now, remember, he works under USPAP. There's a standard, standard procedure that he uses. And when he does his appraisal, he is going to collect two sets of data, two different types of data. The first set of data is called the general data. The general data is about the property and the neighborhood. Is it bank owned driven? Meaning are there a lot of bank owned properties? What's the crime rate? Is the market increasing or decreasing? How's the neighborhood? Then the second set of data he's going to collect is called the specific data. These are the numbers of the properties, like three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet. These are the actual numbers that he will use to manipulate his value. And I don't want to say manipulate because that sounds uh, nefarious. These are the numbers he would use to derive the values, all right? So two sets of data, you got the generic or, or the general and the specific, okay? Now at the top of the next page is kind of an outline that they all follow. And if you'll notice, one of the outlines is to define the problem. All right, <clears throat> an appraiser can appraise many different things. Remember this appraisal foundation was created for all appraisers, not just residential purchases, which are the ones that most of you guys only think about because that's the ones we deal with. There are rules for appraising businesses. There are rules for appraising commercial property. There's a, uh, rules for appraising personal property. We're not going to get into that. We are only going to discuss a residential purchase appraisal. When a person refis, they send an appraiser out. That's a refi appraisal. We're not going to really talk about that either. So when it says define the problem, remember there can be many different issues. Is this a residential purchase? Is this a business liquidation uh, valuation? Is this a refinance appraisal? So that defining the problem to us, we only think of one thing, but there are many different types of appraisers and they all fall under this use path on how they do it, all right? There's one section in there that talks about uh, three different types of method we're gonna talk about. Now, there's a section in there that talks about determining the highest and best use. This is the old adage I'm sure you guys have heard about the value of real estate is all what? There are three words. What are, what are the three words that give value? Location, location, location. That's what you've all heard. They actually use that. It's called the highest and best use, all right? So that's one of the steps in there. Now, there are three ways to appraise property depending on what we're doing. There is the sales comparison approach, there is a cost approach, and then there is an income approach. 
the appraiser will do all three of these on this residential property that we are discussing, okay? So keep that in mind, three different approaches, and that's where most of your heartburn is going to come with this chapter when we actually get into it. So the uniform appraisal, appraisal report is over on the next page, you can see that. And notice that it's called the 1004. At the bottom of the page, it says form 1004. That's kind of the slang. Hey, did you get the 1004 done? That's the slang in, in the business, all right? <clears throat> Notice it's six pages. We're not going to cover any of those because I've told you before that the forms are irrelevant in the, the course. Just notice that it's six pages long, and those are the legal pages. So that's what the appraiser is going to do to make sure that he gets this done. So flip all the way over onto page 312, and we're gonna talk about this word called value. All right, we should get rid of the word price. We don't deal in price anymore. We deal in value. That is our most common thing. Value can be adjusted in four different ways. And I've told you before, this book loves its anagrams or acronyms. One of those, I can't, it's acronym, I think. <clears throat> the acronym for value is called DUST. You've got demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. These four items are the key elements that create or determine value. The demand. If a property is in demand, it will go for higher than it normally would. Hence the word supply and demand we talked all the way back about in chapter two. Utility. How, util how many different ways can you utilize a property? Could it be residential? Well, it also could potentially be commercial. If there are two different ways to use this, in theory, that would bring more buyers to the table and more buyers would tend to run the price up and bring the value up. So the utility is very important. Scarcity, the fewer number of a property there are, the bigger the value. Let me give you a great example. There is like 317 lots that sit on Geist Reservoir. You guys all know where Geist is, right? When one of those lots go for sale, it never goes at a discount because it is very scarce. There's only 312 of them or 17 in the entire world. Compare that to farm acreage. There are millions of acres of farm in the United States. Therefore, hey, if I don't buy these 20, I'll buy those 20 or those 20. So in Geist, the lots are very scarce. That runs the value up. Now, transferability means how easy is it for the seller to transfer the property to the buyer? And we have mentioned this three or four different times about liens causing your property to have no not be able to sell what do you think a one hundred thousand dollar property is worth with a million dollar environmental cleanup on it zero because you can't transfer the property to another person with clean title because of the environmental so virtually those uh, examples we talked about the other day where the house was worth 150 and we had $160,000 worth of lien, by definition, it has no value because you can't transfer it because you're upside down. You've got more liens than the value of the property. Makes it harder to transfer. So those four things will manipulate value. And what we're trying to get is this thing called market value. Now, market value is a very long definition. 
You guys ready? I always have to take a deep breath. The most probable price given knowledgeable buyers and sellers without undue pressure using cash or an equivalent at an arm's length transaction. Yeah, it's got five parts to it. The most common price or the most uh, probable price, not the highest, not the lowest, not the average. It's the most probable price given knowledgeable buyers and sellers. I had a guy call me out of California and he said, hey, I want to do a reality show about commercial property. And he called me because he knew in 2014, I did a reality show here in Indianapolis that aired on TV about rehabbing real estate. So he got a hold of me and he said, look, I want to do a commercial property. He said, but I want to do small deals, you know, like eight to $15 million. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. Eight to 15 million, you can buy all of Indianapolis for that, all right? He was calling from Los Angeles where that was a small commercial deal. And I was telling him here, you know, million, you can get a nice size strip center. So he was unknowledgeable about our market. That plays a key role in this, all right? Arm's length transaction, we've already talked about that. Would you sell to your mother cheaper than you'd sell to your friend or to me? Yes. So this market value is what we're trying to achieve. Another component is without undue pressure. Folks, foreclosure is a pressure on the property. I think I've relayed this story once before, but here's the best place it should fit. I had a client that was in the military. Have I told you the military story? <clears throat> Where he left and the wife stayed behind to sell the property. And then she ended up taking the next offer because she missed her husband, wanted to leave, wanted the kids to start school. She was burdened with heavy pressure. So when my CMA showed 144 to 149 and the offer came in at 139 and she took it, it fell outside of the range of my CMA because the definition of market value broke down. The undue pressure section broke down. So once that one of those breaks down, market value goes out the door. So as an appraiser, you are supposed to use properties that give a true market value. Theoretically, the property that I closed on the MLS, an appraiser should not use because it gave an unfair value because market value broke down. You get what I'm saying? It's not a true value. You don't want your neighbor's house to sell for 139 because, you know, the Thompsons sold for 139. Well, they're sold for 139 because pressure got the biggest part of her and she sold quicker than she should have without, uh, if she would have followed market value. If we can get a sales price inside of our range, what do we call that? That's called a sale. That's what we're trying to get, all right? If you get an offer and subsequently a close in that range of 144 to 149, then you did your job correctly because that's what you determined the value was in that range and they came in and brought an offer. So then what's market price? We just defined market value. What is market price? Anybody? What the seller asked for? Mark, the seller would ask for market value based on us doing our CMA. Mm -hmm. well, what property? do you think the price actually is? The property price? The property? 
it's what the buyer actually